remember when we're talking about the three players in a line that's only in serve receive whenever we're playing defense we need to have this kind of rotation and this would be the exact time we would use a diagram so the circle on mark's screen is the attacker on the other side of the net and then this would be the defensive structure. So the person that is the closer X to the net would be the other blocker or the setter on your team. And they would pull back to play defense. But at no point are they going to be in a, in a straight line. Welcome yeah. to the Better at Beach podcast. My name is Mark. This is Brandon. He just introduced himself on Instagram. Yeah. But we, uh, we got everything rocking and rolling. Today we're going to talk about a topic we haven't really covered yet. Just like you said. There you go, four on four volleyball. I yeah. think a lot of people, people get confused. I still see people in fours leagues who are not in a good serve receive position. Like they don't actually know how to set themselves up with the talk of diamonds or squares or what formation you want to have. They don't know where to position their setter or why you should set a certain hitter in any situation. And maybe we could touch a little bit on how to actually recruit for your four on four beer league so that you can you can crush it. Um, that's what we're gonna be covering today. Should be fun. Still in New York with my family. You're back in California. Glad you made the trip safe. I am. Yeah. Yeah, we had a fun little clinic out in uh, Long Island this weekend. Uh, it, was, it was cool to see you in your hometown. Very close to your hometown, you know, obviously raised in Queens, but I feel it too. Whenever I go back to Virginia, there's a little source of pride um, and it's, it just feels really cool to always bring back what we've learned, what we've accomplished back to our hometowns and states. And for me, looking, looking at you, it was really cool to see, not that you don't always do this, but you could tell that you were a little bit like happier to be there. You were a little bit driven to talk to everybody, to get, mm. get it get your advice to every single person there. So it was really cool to, for me to see that. So why don't you talk to us about how you felt going home? I love it. I, you know, I love, it is cool to, to try yeah. to find younger me and be like, you should show up. You know, I don't know if younger me would have paid for a clinic, which is so stupid. So stupid. I mean, the first thing mm -hmm. when we talk about like coaches and getting coach, there was a friend of mine from Australia. She was ranked number seventh in the world and trampoline. So she was a gymnast and she was a trampoline and she crushed it. And she, she then converted herself to become a beach volleyball player. She just got obsessed with it. And she said that the thing that comes from gymnastics is they, in their sport, have this obsession with finding the best possible coach is the first thing that you do. You go to the best training gym with the best performance or the best history of performance. And when she said that to me, she's like, well, wow. I mean, there's obviously somebody there who's been through every single problem that you have, who's, who's already tackled it, and they can get you there. So why wouldn't you have somebody lead the way? And so she said that all of her finances, every, everything that she did, she put it into coaching first. That was the first thing. She goes, how do I afford the best coach that I can find? And she went on three years into the sport, and she's finishing in the semis and finals of every single Australian national tournament. And I was like... Holy crap. Obviously, she, you know, she's a freak athlete, but the commitment to finding that, yeah, there are problems that are just easy to solve and somebody's got the answers. Why don't I just go to somebody who I can ask and who's going to make me do the right thing every time? And so it, if I had found that a little bit early on or somebody, or if I had that mentality, there would have been a lot of skipping through a bunch of pain. Uh, now I'm happy with the, the people that I find and that I have found. And this year, you know, I'm, I'm still looking for who's going to lead the way so that I can be an athlete this year, less than a coach. And a lot of people get that a little bit backwards where you spend so much time coaching because so many of us on the AVP are part-time or full-time coaches. We have to be able to afford the season, but it's so difficult to pull yourself out of coach mentality and just decide to go and play, compete, rip somebody else's head off. You know, instead of like, oh, look at their inefficient footwork while they're spiking at me and I should be digging and returning that anyway. <laughs> yeah. So we, um, it's kind of interesting because we, we had a conversation at the clinic. I can't remember who, at, maybe it was Anne who asked us, um, but she said, do you guys get to find the joy in playing still, even though your lives are so revolved around volleyball? And that, that's a question that I get a lot. But having that coach there at practice or 
having a good group of friends that are willing to train and are really willing to work hard. That is what allows us to keep playing for fun. Yeah. You know, it, it gives it a little bit of a different mentality. I know for me, I'm the one that can talk about this. You've been running a lot of our practices recently, so you're still in coach mode, running a lot of this and, and such like that. But eventually we will find somebody to be running all our practices. Yeah. And that's how we're able to kind of step back and the learning process becomes something important again. And it allows us to kind of just think about playing and enjoying the moment a little bit. So it's, yeah. it's definitely a, it's a good thing to think about. Yeah, it's, it's nice now that planning has become so automatic that I can do it in 20 seconds and then return back to athlete mode. You know, mm -hmm. here's your drill. Let's go. Uh, for any of you guys who are out there and you kind of want that for yourselves, you can't, or you're the person who's leading training or you want to lead training and you have those ideas or else, we do have something for you. It's uh, 50 plus. We built it for you. We've got a bunch of years under our belt. And and we're happy to provide it. So just uh, betterbeach.com forward slash spence. Hey, check this out. Let's get to four on four volleyball, shall we? Four on four. I like it. And that, that's another reason. So one of the big things that I answered that question with when Ann asked us, how do you still have fun? Four on four is actually one of the biggest and easiest ways for me to have fun playing beach volleyball. Mm. I have a phenomenal crew in Redondo where we go and play uh, every Friday. And it is my time to just not think about work. It is my time to be there with friends, maybe have a couple beverages, not recently, but soon enough. And uh, it, it really is just fun. It allows you to still work on your game while you have kind of like a lighthearted thought process going into it. So love some 4B4. And there's there's so much with 4-on-4 four four that, that can make you a better two on two player just certain scenarios that we'll talk about like just being able to swing against a double block with no fear you know once mm -hmm. once you get over that a single block you just don't care about so right. uh, we'll talk about that but the first thing that that i do want to talk about is what types of players you need or you would want on your team to be successful and where you want to put them so for me this has to start with your top outside hitter your left side hitter. They're usually going to be the easiest person to set. You want them to be big. You want them to be courageous with their swings. So you want them to have a big arm. And this is the person, if you don't have two, okay, but this is the person that you're going to set on match point, that you're going to set when it's 18-18, 19-18, 20-18, and then 21. You want them to take every swing at that point. And the rest of your team should understand that right it's this is kind of like kobe lebron michael jordan whose hands do you want the game when it's on the line everybody else works to set up and open this person who is most likely to get points and kills the first thing that i do recommend is finding yourself a nice big hitter so that they can hit boom everything on either the left side or if you guys are playing in wind put them on the side where they can hit into the wind that's the person that you want swinging that ball most people are like oh well we'll put our better athlete on the harder side because you know they can do that but in four and four you have a choice mm -hmm. of who you can set it's an easier set when you set with the wind and your big can get even bigger when they're hitting into the wind so whoever your rock star, big, big time game winning arm is, that's who you put on the good side of the court hitting into the wind and you put them out towards the antenna so that you can set them. If you put them in the middle, you can't set them because the angles don't work out. And I think so many people who came from like kind of high school, middle school mentality. A lot of times in kind of putting this into image, whenever we have in California, we have a big ocean wind. So the wind comes from the ocean and it pushes inland. So on one side of the court, that strong hitter will be on the left side. But then when they switch sides, that strong hitter will stay on the right, will stay on the same sideline. And that will allow that person to be hitting back into the wind every single time. Whenever we're thinking about skill positions and the players that should be playing certain positions, something that comes to my mind is, especially in California, a lot of the times we have 
these force tournaments where they are set up where it is a a level player or you have it's a b c and d and the a player is always the best player is the best hitter it's the person that is going to get set like mark was talking about you're going to put them on the good side of the court good half of the court so that whenever they get set they are swinging into the wind they're swinging as hard as they can they're going to be getting a lot of the sets Normally the B level player or the second best player on the court. And it depends if you're, if you're playing in a competitive tournament, this B level player, your first three players might be somewhat similar, but normally the B level player is the setter because we want that person to be able to set that hitter every single time. Shouldn't matter where the pass is, shouldn't matter what type of play it's going on that second player, the B-level player, the setter, should be able to get to almost every single ball and put it up so that that A-level player can swing at everything, okay? The C-level player normally is going to be known for their ball control and maybe their swinging, depending on the level of play. So when we think about the C-level player, we're thinking about somebody who is going to be playing cross-court of the best player on the other side of the net. Because whenever we think about that best player on the other side of the net, we want to put one of our better players diagonal of them because most of the time everyone's favorite swing is cross court. And so we want to go ahead and set up our defense so that our third best player is the person digging. If you're playing in some type of co-ed league or a competitive league, then normally that C-level player will also be a threat offensively, meaning that after they get the dig, they can be the opposite side hitter on on your same side of the net. But kind of like what Mark was saying before, we still want to set that A-level player as much as we can. Obviously, if you're up a couple points, that's when you can throw a couple sets back to that C player. But most of the time, you're still going to set that guy. And then finally, the fourth person, the D-level player, And we don't need to call them the worst player on the court, but they're probably not as much of an offensive threat. And they're going to be like, if we're thinking about transitioning indoor play, indoor skills to the beach, then this would be our libero, somebody who is known for their passing. And then they're going to kind of sit behind that big blocker on your side, who is your A player. They're going to be ready to run down some shots. They're going to read the def- the offense a little bit, and they're going to kind of rotate into some positions to allow themselves to help out their team as much as they can. Whenever we're thinking about those four players, it's really important to think about where they are. So once again, if you're competitive, then more than likely all the players on your team are probably right around the same level, but we want to think about skills. If All of you are around the same level, but Johnny is a great setter, then obviously he should be the one setting. We're not going to make Johnny hit. So it's just important to kind of think about that. I I really, really like this style of tournament that we play them a lot in California. And we don't even know who we're playing with when we show up to the tournament. They do blind draws and you sign up as an A, as a B, as a C, as a D. And then the morning of the director puts you into these teams and if we didn't have an idea of where these certain players should be playing, then it would take us a long time to figure out our rhythm and figure out where we should be playing. I, I think that knowing where these players should play, what position and why they are going to be playing that position is something that we're definitely going to be considering before the game even starts. I think what you're saying is it's a good thing to try to be honest with people as you're, as you're recruiting them and saying, our team needs a great setter. Mm-hmm you're that guy, you're that girl. You know, our team needs a great digger. You're that guy, you're that girl. Not not our team needs a great player or a great anything, but mm-hmm. we need somebody out there who can cover a lot of court on defense and passing, hopefully. Uh, you need somebody who can take big swings, and you need somebody who can lay up a decent ball for them, which is that setter. The argument starts to well, not the argument. Hopefully no one's arguing in force. <laughs> but... When you're setting people up, you said, hey, let's put the defense, if it's the worst person, let's put them kind of in the middle as a libero. And there's a bunch of different ways that you can do this. But 
there is a chance that you do want, maybe it's not your least athletic, but you do want your best passer taking over most of the court. And it's okay if you're, if you're a player, your big hitter is also just like the most experienced volleyball player. They've got the most control. It's a good idea to have them pass half the court and have the other two take a quarter of the court. You know, they each got their own quarter. If this person's going to be able to pass more, they've got more experience. You don't have to share these responsibilities equally. They don't even do it in the Olympics. You know, if you watched Sergio from Brazil years ago as a libero, he would on float serves kick one of his outside, uh, one of his outside hitter passers out. So he would pass half the court and he'd say, I got you, you know, because he was the best passer he could take over. He could let them hit. So when you're setting this up again, you need that power hitter on the outside. You need the setter who's waiting at the net uh, and then need a defender floating deep somewhere in the back. Now, can we talk about some maybe defensive Let's talk about offensive four basin first. Let's talk about how to set up in serve receive. Get rid of this diamond. Everybody right now, save this video, share this video, get rid of your diamond formation. It is one setter at the net and three people in one straight line in serve receive. If you want to kick somebody out of serve receive because they're struggling, they're not great, they're embarrassed, they don't want to pass, then you got two people in a straight line, and this person should be supporting them and building their confidence. <laughs> you got this. <laughs> okay, you know, we have short middle. We're going to dive in front of you as three passers, if you're dividing it equally in three. You have, let's just say that you have your lane going forward and backwards. You have your forward and backwards lane. So you have short and you have deep. Now, sometimes you talk about seams, especially a lot of indoor players will talk about like, what happens in the, in the area between us, if it hits exactly between us. And this is a conversation that you try to have before every serve. So if somebody, like maybe the better or more confident passer, will say, hey, I got this ball between us. And that'll give somebody who's a little less confident, more confidence to say, okay, this person just, just said that they're going to take more court from me. If you got two equal passers, but one of them's the libero or the passer type, they can say, hey, you go hit. I'll pass your seam. I'm going to free you up. No more diamond. Get in a straight line. Put your serve receivers in a straight line. And then you can have three hitters. That little defender, they can come straight forward and hit out of the middle if they need to and you want to get them some sets. That's not where your big points and your important points are going to go to. Because for you to use a middle hitter, your passing and digging has to be at a very, very, very high level. So if you're putting your best hitter in the middle in four on four, you're probably wasting them. If they're also the best passer, you want them to help a little bit more towards the middle. So again, we go back to that, you know, the, the, the freak athlete has half of the court and the other two have, have that quarter of the court. A straight line and serve receive, setter waiting at the net, and you're trying to set more antenna balls than middle balls. The only goal for the middle uh, when you set them is to try to maybe get the other team to stop blocking the outside hitters or to be late to the antenna hitters. Yeah, and we're just talking basics here. We're, we're going to go over a few strategies. Uh, this isn't the Bible of four on four volleyball, but it is a great starting point that I think nobody covers and everybody needs to hear. And something I'll add to the positioning, I really like what you said about the passers being in a straight line. And that that line should be about three quarters of the way back into the court. Normal serve receive depth that you would have in, in serve receive. But for some reason, we do see those wing defend wing passers step up a little bit and that middle person back a little bit in fours. Mm -hmm. And I don't understand where that came from, but it definitely does happen. But we also need to talk about the positioning of the setter. We've talked about this a little bit on the podcast before as far as momentum. And you always want to set yourself up so that you can move into sets. Whenever you have, sometimes what we commonly see for setters in fours is that they stand in the middle of the court facing all of their passers. And now you're not able to get around a whole lot of stuff. You're, you're making all of your sets facing your setters because you're not going to square up. If there's no wind, I think you start on the sideline, maybe in between the middle of the court and the sideline 
opposite of your big hitter. I know that might sound weird because it's like, wait, you're making me start further away from the hitter I'm going to set, but you still tell your passers to pass in the middle of the court, but this will allow you to use your momentum to go into that set, which is going to make the set easier, which is going to make your attacker able to read your set a little bit more, and you're going to find a little bit more confidence. If you have wind, so now let's say so a lot of times in California, we have that ocean wind like I talked about. And when you flip to the other side of the court, this whole idea of indoor setting is kind of out the window where you don't always have to be square to the left side of the court. You should always set yourself up so that you are setting your best player. And if my attacker is on the right side and he is swinging or she is swinging hard cross court into the wind, then I'm still going to be in between the middle and the sideline further away from my attacker because that once again that that wind is going to push balls closer to the attacker and then you'll be able to use your momentum and we as setters we love running forwards but we hate running backwards i would rather run eight steps forward than have to take one step back and i think that that's a pretty common thing for most setters whether you realize it or not i always talk about it at camp or clinics whatever we're doing where whenever players pass onto the other half of the court, I call that a no crap set or a no crap pass because yeah. that's what the setter does. They start running to the net and then they have to backpedal and they're like, oh crap, what am I going to do now? I think the the setup of the setter is just as important, if not more important than where the passers are going to be. I love that point. Not having them directly middle. Right. That's, that's really, really nice. That space to move forward. That's massively, massively important. I think most people will just sit right there in the middle and then there's no, you're not leading anyone where to pass you. This does not tell the passer, hey, if the setter's positioned all the way on the right side of the, of the net, it doesn't tell your passers to pass that way, right? We still want to pass towards the middle so that our setter has options. We want to lead their chest so that they move forward into the ball. So just because setter, you need to kind of captain this. You need to say, hey, I'm going to start over here. You guys, I want you to pass middle. Yeah, it, I think that's a pretty general theme in, in the sport of beach volleyball. That is, especially at the lower levels, it's not thought about a lot. We want to always put the ball where we want our partner to end up, yeah. not where they currently are. That sentence solves it all. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely. Let's talk about some basic defensive strategies. For everybody out there, if you're playing in a four on four league, measure all of your jump heights. Your players cannot jump and get a full hand, a full hand over the net. They should not block, period. You're wasting them by hanging them in the air, trying to get them to jump and taking up basically not enough space to be anywhere near effective. So if they can't get their full hand over the net, peel them into the court, don't hide them, take up space, put their hands up, right? But don't have them jumping for no reason when they're only getting little digits over the net. Yes, one in every 100 balls, they might feel amazing when they get a touch on their fingers and the ball also hits the net and then they call it a block or it rainbows off of their fingers and falls for, falls for a high block, block point in the other court. But if you don't have the people who can get full hands over the net, stop blocking, stop blocking, stop blocking. That also goes for the other side of the court. If the other team cannot hit down hard, and we'll say front half or front three quarters of the court, they don't have those athletes. Don't block them either. The only time you want to be waiting at that net is if that set is too tight and you can actually grab it or hit it on your own. After that, now, if you do have your blockers, first we'll start with a one blocker scenario. Defense positions, here's where everybody gets confused. I think this becomes like a giant hockey substitution because you have your position on defense and your responsibility there, and that will put you out of position for your offensive position. So you can be a blocker and a setter, right? Or you can be a hitter and a setter. So if you're only playing with two blockers, you're allowed to block two. So one person will block the left and maybe the middle. One person will block the right and maybe the middle. If we're playing with our two like big hitters up front or our two big people up front, and then you have your setter back, you'd like to put your setter away from where the best hitter is. So if they're defensively, you want to put them back. You want to put them opposite of where they're going to set the most people, uh, the most balls, because you want them to move forward into it, like you just said. A lot of times, the setter then who's on defense, 
they'll have to dig a ball. That's when you might ask your defender, that ball control person, to come in and try to set the big people, right? Try to set the big hitter. Again, try to figure out a system or a secondary setter where we can get the ball to the person who's going to score points. So if the, if the setter digs the first ball, your team should have a designated person that sets the ball when your setter is not available. That happens in a very rushed manner. It doesn't always work out, but they should want to take over the setting responsibilities if your true setter digs the first ball. Because if, you're, if your big athletic person then has to set the second ball, you don't have a great chance at a kill. So. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, I'm going to go ahead and call everybody out on this podcast right now. You're going to have this conversation after you lose a point when your setter dug the ball. <laughs> so just remember this moment. Mm -hmm. And then after that moment happens, be like, oh, darn it. He even told me this is going to happen. <laughs> so from now on, if the setter gets a dig, this person's going to be in charge of setting. <laughs> Great. 100%. Right. And it still happens to us. I'm not just calling you guys out. It happened to me two weeks ago. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, the plays, plays are going to get random. Somebody else is going to have to set besides those right. two players. Right. And if you're if the person who maybe wants to take control of the game at that point is the like zero ball control drill killer, random shanks every time they touch the ball. Yeah, you, you want to see them involved, but that's not what's going to help you win. <laughs> Right. So the setter takes the first ball or digs it. Somebody else, one person should be responsible for the second ball to set it and should be designated before you lose the first point because of it. Also for the setter, you know, when they, when they don't dig the first ball, if they're still on the ground or if they just blocked, you want them to take control. They're your quarterback. So you want them to have the set in their hands. You want them to be bumping and setting to the right people. So they should be that hustle person. Your setter should be the person that will literally shove somebody out of the way in order to set the ball, right? That that responsibility has to happen. It's not like, hey, well, it went to the middle. Hey, well, it went to the right. No, 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 no. Your setter is your setter. Setter set, right? So you have to let them do that. You have to get out of their way. And setters, be bossy. Scream, mine. And there's, there's one libero when I was trying out in Italy. I, I was about to pass a free ball. I was playing outside, and he was trying out for libero. And we were both about to pass a free ball, and he came right next to me, and he screamed, my! You know, like, and he, and he did it so sharp and so fast that he literally scared me off of the ball, kind of jumped away. And then I ran, and I hit, and I actually got a kill. I went to him. I go, I love that. I love that you took control of your passing responsibilities and that allowed me to get into a better approach and hit, but he did it with such a way that there was no confusion over who wanted and who had that ball. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, he, he, he let me know. And, and, and I liked when he screamed that loud and he took over. If you're a passer, pass. If you're a setter, set. When we're thinking about defense and we're thinking about the setup, what I think about a lot, and I, I kind of want to get into this rotation idea because I think a lot of people don't don't pick up on that. So I think the setup should be almost like a square. Let's say on, on the, yes. Okay. On so defense. we're playing defense. All right. So we we're back serve, on defense. And, and this is when we're at the net. We have, we have both of our blockers at the net. Cause I think most of the time in fours, we only see one blocker. And so this would, this would be the case for one blocker. If we have two blockers, that means you're playing a really high level and the defenders are going to kind of move around, around those blockers. But when we have a, a one single blocker at the net, then we have the person at the net who is the blocker. Obviously, they're not going to be leaving the net. They're going to be the person that's up there. Hopefully, they're they're big, like Mark was talking about before, where they can get both those hands clearly over the net. They can shut down a player if they're if they're on a hot streak. Um, but the other three players need to think about rotating, and it's just a little slide where they're going to be sliding into the most opportune area to where the attacker on the other side can hit. So if we have that other person who is at the at the net with the blocker, they, they don't want to stay at the net because now they're pretty useless if they stay there. You're really just staying there for some kind of cut shot. You're almost going to become the third defender in the back row. And so if you think about it, maybe 12 feet off the net. Should not be getting further than... I would say right around that area. If you are, then you're probably taking that the other person who's going to be cross court. So the defender 
So now we know that the person at the net is going to rotate off the net about 12 feet. So now they're kind of in a very sharp, hard driven area from the attacker on the other side. Okay. So let's restart. So we got two, two blockers at the net, two defenders in the back. Yep. And we're facing the net. They set our left hand. So that person stays. Our, our left blocker stays. Right. Our right blocker. Right blocker back. pulls off the net about 12 feet. Okay, cool. Right? Yep. The person that is also on the right side of the court, but is also is in the back row. So back right, right behind the person. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So back right, right behind the blocker who pulled, you're going to be playing very, very close to that person, maybe about four or five feet apart from one another. But you are going to place yourself in what, what I call the danger zone. That person, the attacker on the other side, if they hit that ball as hard as they could cross court, outside of the hands of the blocker that's up there, then you should be sitting right in that zone every single time. And you're just ready to wear that hard hit that that attacker is going. That's two players or three players. We have the blocker who's staying. We have the opposite side of the net who's going to pull off and play defense with that cross court defender. And then we have our fourth player who is going to kind of set themselves up behind the blocker. And this is where it's really useful to have somebody who has a really high IQ of beach volleyball because they're going to be in charge for the tips over the block or the pokes over the block, depending on what type of rules you're following. And four, sometimes people are allowed to tip a ball like indoor, but illegal on the beach. Or they might have to sit into the line if that blocker decides to give up some line to where they could swing hard down the line. So the person who's playing behind that blocker, they're not really going to be moving too much, mm -hmm. but they're going to be reading the attacker a lot. If they feel like there's a threat of them turning it down the line, they need to sit down the line and be ready to make that dig. If you feel like that area is taken, taken away, then more than likely you're looking to take what we call the honey pot, you know, which is the middle of the court. It's a kind of an easy little princess cutty right over the block. Mm -hmm. um, that, the donut. Yeah. So whatever you want to call it, the honey oh, pot, sweet. the donut, the, the black hole, the, the black <laughs> hole where everyone kind of thinks it's their ball. But, but if you're playing cross court, you're kind of dug in. So it's kind of mm -hmm. hard to move forward. We would like that fourth player, the person right behind the blocker to make that move and go get that dig. Hopefully that was a good explanation yeah. without without yeah. diagrams. <laughs> that's, that's visualize, but yeah. yeah. Um, set up a box on defense. Whichever side they set, that person stays. The person who's at the net, the opposite side, has to get off the court and right. help out on defense. Mm -hmm. Now, we'll, we'll also say, so when we're talking about four-on-four four strategy, we still want to have the signs that we have in two-on-two, two, whether I'm going to block line or I'm going to block cross. The majority of the hits will be hard cross. So theoretically, we want to get the most bodies diagonal from the person who's hitting, right? That means maybe blocker, maybe two defenders. Now, I'll give away my big secret for my championship winning four strategy. <laughs> it's too early. <laughs> <laughs> I know, but it's coming. I know. But if you, have a, if you have a solo blocker, we still want two defenders in the diagonal and one down the line. I usually dare people to hit hard down the line. You know, I think it needs to be a really tight set. They need to have a, a really good approach, and I'm forcing them towards the sideline. Right. But I don't want to block cross and then have two of my defenders down the line because now I only have two bodies in the diagonal. Instead, I'm going to leave my defenders in the diagonal. I'm going to leave one down the line for tips and that line swing. I'm going to run fours. As a blocker, I'm going to dive angle maybe six, seven, eight out of ten times. Hitters want to hit cross unless they're really tight and on the net and the ball's leading them there. Most hitters will go cross. Right. So I'm going to keep showing him that it might be open and then diving cross as a blocker, that makes me end up with three people in the diagonal. And hopefully I have a really quick person down the line who can pick up a chippy line or a tip over. I like that. That's a really good play. And I think a lot of people do get stuck on that idea of, I'm not going to dive in front of my defenders because there's two people back there and I want to want to let them get some digs. Fours, the, the area of the court is, is a little bit bigger. I don't, I don't think we touched on that yet but mm -hmm. normally the court is a little bit larger for fours it's closer to this is it the same size as indoor yeah nine by nine okay nine so by nine not, meters or 30 by 30 feet yeah so but there's not a whole lot of defenders out there where if you dive cross and you get a touch on the ball even if they don't get the dig a lot of times they're not going to be like what are you doing up there you know 
they might ask every yeah. now and then to be like, hey, leave this one and let me see if I can get them, you know. But for the most part, they're going to say, hey, good touch. We'll get mm -hmm. them next time. They know? should. So I, yeah. Unless they should. The people with a jerk. Keep, like, yeah, they get like the stolen balls. Like, oh, you stole that from me and you got to touch. You, know, you got to touch. You slowed mm -hmm. it down. It means you put yourself in the, in the right position. But yes, instead of yelling, saying, don't do that. You're stealing my balls. Say, let me get him. You know, say something that's cooler, <laughs> mm -hmm. a little more confident. Like, I want this guy. Lead him yeah. straight to me. Um, and we do that in twos as well. You know, you'll very, the blocker will very obviously leave something open so that the defender's saying, I want him one-on-one. -on -one. I used to say that as, as a libero in college. Leave that line wide open. Like, bring him to me. I'm going to dig him all night. And that's a better way than saying, don't, don't dive in there. You're stealing my balls. Because... Then you're encouraging somebody to say, like, when they see a swing or a play about to happen, that they're not allowed to go for it, even though they know they can stop it and win the point right there. Yeah. You know, there's, a, there's a quick difference. You gotta Which it. can become a very slippery slope. Mm -hmm. Super slippery. Yeah. And I think that that, that, <laughs> that happens a lot in twos as well. I know sometimes you'll feel like you're in a rhythm and then all of a sudden you stop making instinct moves and you start thinking about things too much. So, but the conversation is important. Yeah. And you know, don't make, don't make rules, make a, Hey, let's try this for three points. You know, instead of the, don't do this, don't do this ever. Let me, let me try to take him one-on-one -on -one for the next three. I think I can dig it, you know, or I'm going to go with whatever I see as a blocker for the next like three, four, five points. And you can do whatever you want back there, but I think I can get them. If you try that experiment, make sure that there is a set end to the experiment where you decide, is it working? Is it not? Did we even get the opportunity to implement it? You know, if you should carry on with it or not, or if it didn't work three balls in a row. Fine. Okay. Move on to the next little mini strategy. We got a pretty good uh, comment from Steiner as so cold. So it sounds like no rotating. Um, and I know like Steiner is so cool. Oh yeah. <laughs> I wonder, is that a play on words, Steiner? Okay. <laughs> but if you are in a league where you are rotating, I love those leagues. You know, I think that that's great. You give everybody an opportunity to perform a skill, but it's important to still remember that you can still make each position responsible for something. You know, I think a lot of times whenever we have teams rotating a lot, that's where we get this idea of sharing touches and that can be really, really tough because you never really get into a rhythm. Even before the game, whether you have somebody who's going to stay as the big hitter on your team, that's great. If you don't and you're going to rotate, that's okay. But still keep that one position as your big hitter. So make it your big left side or the person who's going to be swinging into the wind. Obviously, the person at the net, make them be the setter. Make them start from that position that you want them to. And so I think all of the all of the ideas that we gave you about rotation and offense, those can still be the same. But it's important to realize what you're going to be doing when you're in each position. Uh, that way, your team can find a rhythm and you can become you can figure out ways to score. I like that question. We don't rotate a whole lot in our fours. We kind of have a specific area where we want to play and we want it like I want to be a right side. I want to be a setter. I want to be a left side. But if you do rotate, it's fine. But the responsibilities of those positions still stay. If we're playing family, fun, chill, barbecue, beach day, four on four, rotate. Just know that, you know, when we're on offense, that serve receive lineup, everybody still stays in the same line. And the person who's front middle, okay, they become the setter. That that has to stay. We're still never, never, never getting into this diamond nonsense. Okay. But that way you can rotate equally. But if you're trying to actually win, if you're getting competitive and you need that t-shirt or, or you need the, the free pitchers for, for a month or whatever you get, you know? <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you you got to have positions and try them out for a little bit and then maybe put a couple people in different positions. But everybody still serves. Remember that. You still serve in order. So the person who's serving is obviously not in his position yet. The other three are going to be waiting in their positions. And then whoever serves, as soon as you serve it over, you run to your position. When we were playing four on four at FUDS in Florida, we had some of our servers who were, I think I did sometimes, where we served and then we ran all the way to the net to play blocker. Is it tiring? Yes. Is it most advantageous for your defensive lineup? Yeah, it can be. So you still rotate servers, but once you serve, technically, when we say that we serve, 
we say that we're on defense, right? So when you serve, you're on defense. You get into those immediate defensive positions. I like it. I think that's pretty good. I think that's a good summary. Pretty good little summary. We've got some questions here that, that we'll tackle in the, in the Q&A section. And if we divvy this, this video up, uh, into a Q and A session. Just look for volleyball positions for for B four. How to win your beer league, <laughs> and look for look for the Q and A section. But I think we can get into the Q and A after this because this is maybe we should switch our our company, man. This is our highest live attended show. I know people love so, fours. Yeah. Well, and it kind of makes sense to me to be honest because the volleyball community is so cool and. These fours leagues are so relaxed and are usually just good entertainment, good people, and a lot of people that play twos can play fours. So it makes sense to me. In the recorded version, guys, if you're checking it out on YouTube and in the show notes on podcast, we are going to include our four on four fun match from one of our camps in Florida where we have three pros and one camper who gets the Spirit of the Camp Award getting to play with the pros in four on four. Sometimes we go into positions, but when we're doing these matches, this is for fun. And we do know that McKibben Volleyball, if you have not seen them on YouTube, I'm shocked, but they have a ton of legit good four on four Oh my gosh. Where you will see specific people in specific positions. You know, one of the best side out players in the country is setting full time. And that's Casey Patterson, right? He decides to be a setter because he wants some bigger, stronger, higher jumping hitters out there. Or maybe he just wanted to chill for the four on four. <laughs> <laughs> um, but there's a couple places to see this. Uh, you can check out what our camps are like and you get a really good idea of how fun they are by this link that we just posted. And you can check that out in the show notes. And of course you can check out the McKibben Volleyball's uh, series of four on four videos which are super fun those videos they do a great job with them i I, th I think most of them are in texas like in austin or something yeah. like that they ran a few in hermosa and then a couple in texas they, yeah. they ran a nice big event because business is easy in texas yeah and hey if you guys if you ever watch awesome. this <laughs> and you need two more guys let us know we love some fours all right let's answer yeah. some questions I'm going to start down at the bottom. Are you frozen? What are you saying? I'm just trying to find a question. A lot of these are just statements. Oh, okay. I've played a few of reverse co-ed fours. Any suggestions for that particular format? Reverse co-ed. So I guess I don't think I've ever played that, but I would Women assume... Women can block and they can hit front row. Okay. Men cannot block and they have to hit from behind the 10 foot line. Okay. I think the positioning and everything is still the same, but is it on a women's net? Uh, yeah. Okay. If you get any sort of like quality open level male players out there, they're going to be absolutely detonating. Oh yeah. And all it is, is the idea of having, you don't even need a passer in that game. You just need somebody who can put up a consistent set, like at seven feet every time, and then just have your dude detonate if you got an open right. level squad. So it, it sounds like we would put, instead of having our best player at the net, we would put our best player cross court of the hitter on the other side so that they can dig and then hopefully get set. But for those players, you probably want to have the guys hitting a little bit more inside, not completely at the pins because then they'd be running into the, to the girls that are hitting at the pins. So like if we think about the A is on the antenna and then a B and then a C and then a D kind of sideways on a court, maybe those men want to be hitting more of the B and C balls rather than the A and D balls. But I think it could also work with the A, the A and D. It's just a matter of you having that conversation and figuring out where that front row player wants to hit because the female is still going to be a very valuable option in that idea. So. In front, no, front row, probably one-on-one -on, -one, um, on a women's net. But when you're in trouble, you're probably still going to sit. If you got a big boy on your team, back row, you should be annihilating on, on a Revco net. This is like a two-parter. There's a four-on-four -four tournament set for this Saturday, and I have a team signed up. We were going to play Diamond, but I like what you said about having back three more in a, in a line. It makes sense. Also, I like the idea of the two strongest players being next to each other. Yeah, the Diamond, throw it out right now. And the two strongest players being next to each other, that one's kind of getting me a little bit because i'm assuming that this is talking about rotating like this is probably a rotating tournament or but if you if you aren't rotating and you have your strong hitter and your setter up there i think that that's completely correct if you're rotating a little bit you might want to flop it so that your best players are opposite of each other 
Yeah, so if your league makes you put one person front middle, one person right, and then you have to rotate into those positions for whatever reason, if they make mm-hmm. you do that, separate your best players. Make them go away from each other so that they can connect and take up more area. But if you're in a situation where you're playing like it's played at the highest level, and you can serve and you can go wherever you want on the court, then you don't sit up so that the two best players are next to each other. The rotation in that actually doesn't matter anymore because everybody's going to have their locations where they hit and where they play defense. So if you're playing the normal way, which is you don't have to rotate and stay, and the server is not officially a back row person, because when we play four on four, the server can hit front row. Right, uh, that's fine. They don't have to stay back row or anything, um, and that's usually usually not a rule. But if it is, then it makes a difference. So if your server, if you can rotate wherever you want, you don't need your best players next to each other. You end up having to rotate, and a left person has to stay left. A front middle person has to set. Never really seen that uh, again, other than like kind of family ball. Then you want to separate your best players so that they can take over more court, and that way you can you know just mash your cousin in the face. <laughs> it's just a game. <laughs> <laughs> okay where does the setter stand during the serve uh we covered this but really you want to avoid standing directly in the middle of the court uh the way that i i like it is if you're always going to be setting the left side of the court then you should be starting between the middle of the court and the sideline away from that attacker and then your passer should still be passing in the middle of the court allowing you to move into that set so that you're always facing the attacker you're going to be setting. Um, And that that just depends on what side you're on. If the wind is in your favor, then just make sure that you're setting up on the other half of where your attacker is. So that way you can always be moving and looking at the person you're going to be setting. Uh, Not a whole lot do you want to be back setting every single ball to that person. We need a, a chessboard with its own camera for next time. A little magnet right. board. <laughs> yeah. Let us know, guys, in the comments. If you want to see us diagram this, like do a whiteboard set. A little whiteboard. And... <laughs> we can do it. You guys, uh, you yeah, guys just let us go. know. We can do it. And uh, just shoot us in the comments and tell us what you want. And if you have any ideas or you want us to cover a certain topic, go ahead. Shoot a message. We have an entire Excel sheet of questions that come from our volley chat group on Facebook, comes from our members in Beach Volleyball Mastery, and that's what we pick from when we're doing these podcasts and these episodes. So uh, if you have anything that you want us to talk about or riff on, shoot them up on volley chat, shoot them into these comments, and hopefully we, we get them up into the Excel sheet. All right, we got a good one. Where did I find it? Okay, we find B-level that if three defenders are back in a line, then the cut shot is too powerful. Remember, when we're talking about the three players in a line, that's only in serve-receive. Whenever we're playing defense, we need to have this kind of rotation, and this would be the exact time we would use a diagram. But if we have the net here, and our attacker is here... Go ahead, you got it, man. our... It's weird because it's member- mirrored. Our defender that's playing right here would have to drop back just a little bit, like 12 feet. And then we would have our other defender (laughs) right next to them. All right, Mm -hmm. so they would be kind of in this position. And then we have our other defender over here. Okay, so you're not really going to be in a line. You're actually going to be almost between the blocker and the two defenders cross court. It should make a little acute triangle going back to geometry class. Let's go. Look at that. So the circle on Mark's screen is the attacker on the other side of the net. And then this would be the defensive structure. So the person that is the closer X to the net would be the other blocker or the setter on your team. And they would pull back to play defense. But at no point are they going to be in a in a straight line nice diagram i think to me for me to be honest the x that pulled off the net i would like for them to be a little bit closer to that sideline i don't want them to be in a straight line i want them to make like a little curve yeah so Mm -hmm. maybe a little bit further to the sideline but that's if i'm being picky and mark i know mark you had to draw that in a hurry so and uh, art is not my speciality oh i know (laughs) so yeah just to clear that up and serve receive we're straight and defense, we're making that rotation happen. All right. I'll show you just one when we're when we're in serve receive here. This is what we're talking about when we're in serve receive. You got that that setter. See, that's why I don't do art. I can't draw a straight line. The, yeah, the curvy the line over there is the net. <laughs> um, but we got the off center uh, setter, 
And then this player here, this player here in this situation would be your best, your strongest hitter because the setter is furthest away from them, which means that they can move into the set. Mm -hmm. So they can set forward towards the monster, which is this person right here. This is tough. Yeah. I wonder how weathermen and meteorologists do this. I have no, I have so much respect for them now. Yeah. Not that I didn't before, because they're so accurate. All the time. <laughs> there's a 3% chance there's going to be a range. All right. When you are attacking, what are your main thoughts? Where you are about to hit the ball, where the set is, where where the block is, hitting on top of the ball, swinging hard, etc. Let's go over that another time. I'm, yeah, that's a pretty deep question. I think swing hard. When in doubt, swing high. Hard. Just hard. go high. Yeah, don't go low. Yeah, and when we say high, like swing hard, make the ball, try to make the ball cross if you can, so that it's still going down. Try to make the ball cross 18 inches, two feet above the net, so that even if you do get a block touch, right, even if they make a crazy move, it goes off their fingers and either rebounds to you or it continues on to their player. You don't really want to swing low and steep, which is dangerous for just all volleyball players. And I know that everybody likes to see bounces and people hitting straight down, but there's high risk in that. Instead, give a bunch of people haircuts, aim high, deep at their heads. And then once they sit all the way back, then you still load as fast as you can and give a little brush waterfall over that block once you got them on your heels. Oh, that being said, when you don't know where to put the ball, we'll just do a little bit of strategy. If you don't know where to put the ball, you don't know where to hit, you have to think, number one, where is their worst player always positioned? How do I attack the area around them, right? Number two, another option that a lot of indoor teams use is how do I put the ball on the setter? If they have one quality setter, how do I take them or one quality athlete? Like you don't really want to pick on the athlete in this one. You want to pick on the setter. So if they have one quality setter, try to make them move, make them dive so that their set isn't going to be as good and that neutralizes the attacker. What you don't really, really want is to put the ball on the best player if he's clearing away the best player, because then the best player has the opportunity to touch the ball twice. You've given their best player 66% of their offense and might not be a good scenario. So find and memorize the area where their worst player is and put the ball around them, attack them, or figure out if you have to send a free ball or you have to just chip a ball in, pick on their setter. Don't hit it right to them. Make them move, make them scramble a little bit so that they're still struggling, but locate their setter and have a discussion about that as a team. Hey, the guy who always wants to set is positioned back left all the time. So if you're in trouble, send it there. If you're in trouble, send it there. And next question, how do I encourage more timid setters to take charge of the play? Get Let know. Set, setter <laughs> set. Your job is to set. That's it. Your job isn't to call help. Your job's to set. And if you 100% can't get to a ball, then you need to set. And if you aren't doing that, then you're just lazy. Mm -hmm. So either they need to figure out a way to set every single ball that they can, or you need to find a new setter. You and don't want to put the timid, shy person or the immobile, less athletic person at setter. The setter really should be the most mobile person. Mm -hmm. People think that they just sit at front middle and do nothing. That person has got to move to get their hands on the ball. So they should be super agile. If you were to like pick qualities, that setter would be agile AF. And then yeah. your hitter is going to be the one that can jump and hit hard. Yeah. Like and they remember, might, they might not have to be agile, but they can hit and jump. Right. And when we were naming our, our skills, like, so when we did the ABCD, our setter was our B. I mean, so it should be, if not the, it's probably the second best player on your court. One more. Is there wisdom in defense to having one blocker, two players back, and one player coming forward to get any short angle cut shot? That player can also cover the middle hole little shorts. Yeah. I like this as an experimentation. Mm -hmm. Again, we don't want to give you guys rules, but try it out. Say, you know, they've been tipping a lot on us. So, hey, for the next five points, you cover that area kind of right behind the blocker. The big problem that people have with this, and I saw this, <laughs> I saw this with, with that person I was help coaching their college team. They took one of their players out so that she couldn't dig a ball, so that she could set. And when they kind of took her out in defense, I was like, "Why is she right behind the blockers?" So like, "Oh, we don't want her to dig this ball." I'm like, "Okay, but she's literally sniffing, like sniffing the blockers' butts. Like she can't even get that short ball, the short tip, which she's supposed to be covering." When you're covering an area. 
you want to leave yourself just behind that area so that you can move forward into it. So if you're playing in that donut, don't sit on the donut. Sit right around the donut, then you can move forward. But there's a ton of wisdom in that. Uh, if a team's just crushing you on tips and they're not hitting extreme cutties and sharp angles, then you don't need it. Because a lot of teams don't have quality cut shots or sharp angles along the net. So kind of peeling off that that blocker. Instead, you can move them into the center of the court and you say, hey, my two defenders are going to play deep and you're going to cover somewhere behind the blocker. So don't mind that at all. That's a great strategy. All right. We got a couple uh, whiteboard and diagram statements. So we got you guys. Don't you worry. Yeah, Appreciate it. Coming up. Uh, is fours more like twos or sixes? I would say sixes. I think people who played six on six have a better understanding of the rotate, the natural rotations of defenders um, and figuring out where they should be. And to hit. Yeah. You know, Being if you're okay trying to with shoot the blocker in touching fours, the ball. Yes. Yeah. You're trying to shoot around in fours. There's not enough space for you. So if you're one of those people who has, you know, lived and died by their shots in two on two volleyball, your game is not yet built for four on four. You got to be able to rock that ball. All right. Ditch the exactly. diamond. Playing off divid paying off dividends. We love dividends. That's great. The donut hole is called the campfire shot in Texas. That's perfect. Yeah. I like it. That's really good. Everybody sits around a campfire and watches. All right. And last one. Thanks. Extremely helpful. We have a tournament this weekend. So this class was super timely. I will look for one of your live workshops and hope to attend this year. Do you live in Santa Cruz? No, we live in Hermosa Beach and Redondo Beach. But that's awesome. Let us know how it goes. If you get a chance, take a picture of your team and uh, tag us on Instagram. We love seeing people that are playing and uh, that listen to our stuff. So Hold it up the cup. And best of luck. We hope you guys yeah. take it down. All right. I think that's it. Good session. Yeah, that was good. People like this. Guys, if you liked it, if you loved it, you have to let us know. Comments, shares, subscribes. We got stats on all of this. So if people are watching this, if people are sharing it, if people are commenting on it. We know we got some topics that you want to hear about, but anytime you reach out, reach out. Helps us give you guys the stuff that you want. If you guys are in Ohio, we will see you this weekend. I think we have like two, maybe three spots left in Ohio. So and I think we might actually minutes. have a wait list now. So. Oh yeah, it's done. Yeah. Okay. So All right. if you are interested, join the wait list, see what we can do. All right, man. Well, I okay. hope you enjoy some more time with your family. Let them know I miss them already. I will. And uh, I'll see you on Wednesday. Yeah, man. See you on Wednesday. Yep. Everybody else, see you on the sand. See you on the sand. Have a good one, guys. Bye.